our school of uh, criticism and theory uh, has now entered his second half. I can't believe how fast it went. But because it has entered his second half, uh, I am in a position to know exactly and to feel, to experience how uh, wonderful uh, this is. It is really a joy and a continuous enrichment to be part of this school. And I would like uh, to thank for that, to express my deep gratitude to Hent for having uh, invited uh, 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 me to be part of this adventure. I would like also to thank my wonderful uh, uh, seminar, my, the people who uh, I meet with great joy uh, bi-weekly and who are my companions in the examination of the concept of translation. And I thank you, all my colleagues, whom I feel privileged to have now met and now I know you, now you are high up there in my contacts and I would not let you slip out of it even if you are over there in Israel. I also understand uh, why Bonnie said last time that it took her a year and a half to recover from the, from the experience. At first I thought it was just exhaustion. It is exhaustion, part of it, but it is also the fact that this is the time it would take for us to, pr to truly ruminate the experience. I believe that this is something that I'm going to ruminate when I leave uh, uh, Ithaca that I also uh, discovered. You know, uh, uh, Nietzsche fa famously uh, uh, declared that uh, philosophers should share with cows this ability to ruminate. <laughs> he also added that they should have the, the ability to dance. That is, that is true. It sort of balanced the cow comparison. Uh, he, he had in mind, obviously, also very uh, 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 appropriate and reasonable dances, not the kind we have nowadays, not the Beyonce type, I would, I would say. Uh, uh, so, I am adding in my presentation also the ability to be a translator. So I guess that I have turned the very serious thinker of Rodin, the, the philosopher, into some kind of uh, dancing cow addicted to Alta Vista. <laughs> so having done that, allow me to visit uh, the work of one of those dancing cows namely French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, to start uh, this. In Humanisme de l'autre homme, that is what I'm interested in, in my starting point. And in particular, the pages under the headline, Before Culture, from the chapter of the book with the title, Signification and Sense. In those pages, Levinas extols elevation and verticality as what ordains being and as the only mode of existence of universality. Only from the perspective of a signification that, I quote, could be detached from cultures and situated above them is the necessary judgment on those cultures possible, according to Levinas. And if one asks about the reality of such an overarching standpoint outside of any particular cultural perspective, the answer for Levinas is Western civilization. Yes, he stresses the decried Western civilization. Now, before I complete the citation, let me ask in a parenthesis decried by whom and for what reason. Obviously, Levinas is speaking of those who, in his words, manifest, I quote, a radical opposition against cultural expansion by colonization, end of quote. And those would be, first and foremost, obviously, the former colonial subjects themselves. And if that is the case, what do they in fact decry? I would 
say that it is not Western civilization as such, certainly. Rather, the face that the West presented to the people it colonized, which was not the radiance of civility and civilization. That other face is, for example, what the Mahatma Gandhi had in mind when he famously answered to the question, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it, that would be a good idea. I close the parenthesis and I complete the citation of Levinas that I had left suspended. This is what he says. The decried Western civilization that knew how to understand cultures that never understood anything about themselves. The assumption is that there is a Western civilization which is not a culture among cultures, a language among languages, but the Logos itself. Europe simply cannot be another province of the world to evoke here Chakrabarti's provincializing Europe. A Copernican gesture transforming Europe as a planet among other planets is just unthinkable. It is naturally endowed with an anthropological vocation to understand particles particular cultures that never understood themselves, because it has had, and I quote Levinas again, the generosity of liberating the truth from cultural presuppositions. I quote him again, purifying, purifying thought of cultural alluviums and language particularism. That is why, end of quote, that is why in fact, Europe could renounce the very violence of colonialism that other face of her because, I quote again, culture and colonization do not necessarily go together. Now, ours is precisely a time of decolonization. As Levinas writes, it is characterized by the radical opposition against cultural expansion by colonization. And if that comes to mean that even Western cultural expansion has no legitimacy anymore, the result of considering that all cultural personalities, and here I am quoting again Levinas, that all cultural personalities realize the spirit by the same rights, réalis l'esprit au même titre, the result is a loss of orientation. Playing on the words Occident and Orient, Emmanuel Levinas writes, the world created by this saraband of countless equivalent cultures, each one justifying itself in its own context, is certainly disoccidentalized, but it is also disoriented. End of quote. It could be said of such a word in the language of Edouard Grisson, that it is a chaos monde, a chaos word. Levinas certainly could borrow that expression here and speak of a chaos word, except, of course, that it would not have the positive meaning that the phrase conveys in Grisson's language. As we know, the core of Levinas' philosophy, his ethics more precisely, is that the moral ought has its source in the fact that I encounter the naked and vulnerable face of the other person as an absolute transcendence beyond my self-centeredness, and that from that transcendent, she commands me not to kill, or more positively, to serve and to protect life. To say that the other comes to me as a naked face is to say that she does not visit, almost in the religious sense of visitation, she does not visit against the background of her culture or with that culture. By definition, the dyadic I-thou ethical relationship excludes all appurtenances. So the absolute respect for the transcendence that the other person is as naked face 
does not translate itself as a command for respect for other cultures, or rather, for the other's culture. In a manner that is comparable to the way in which the Immanuel Kant of the ethics is certainly not the one who shows disdain for the humanity he describes in his anthropology or geography of cultures, Emmanuel Levinas combines the crucial notion of ethics as hospitality for the other with the strong conviction that, of course, no other cultural personality realizes the spirit by the same rights as the West, which is unique and exceptional in its realization of the translatio studii from Jerusalem to Athens to Rome. It is the same conviction, you, you would be very surprised to be told about any kind of translatio studii, which would go from Athens to Baghdad, to Cordoba, to Marrakesh, and to Timbuktu. It is the same conviction that Husserl expressed in his Vienna Conference of 1935 on philosophy and the crisis of the European man, when he declared that while the rest of the world should understand that it faces the need to Europeanize itself as best as it could, a Europe fully aware of its philosophic telos could not find the slightest reason to Indianize itself in any respect. The language of phenomenology, at least that of Husserl and of Levinas, is obviously and certainly not that of multiculturalism. Loss of orientation is loss of universality, because if signification is tied to language, and we are confronted with the plurality of languages in a decolonized or post-colonial world, the verticality and elevation of the universal is simply impossible as the only dimension we are left with is that of laterality or horizontality. The horizontality where relationships between cultures and language are therefore inscribed. And such a situation will mean no direct or privileged contact with the world of ideas, no access, I quote Levinas, to a universal grammar, but instead going, I quote him again, from one culture to penetrate another as one goes from one's mother tongue to learn another language, end of quote. And Levinas evokes here another phenomenologist, another disciple of Husserl, namely Maurice Merleau-Ponty, as the philosopher who spoke of a lateral universality, which is for him, of course, a contradiction in terms. Before I examine what Merleau-Ponty did say and mean, and what his lateral universal is in order to ask what is wrong with getting out of one's mother tongue to learn another language, let me say here a few words about the fact that today in France, the virulent opposition voiced against so-called post-coloniality and post-colonial studies by authors such as Jean-Francois Bayard or Jean-Louis Amsel, opposition to what Bayard has called, I quote the title of his book, the academic carnival of post-colonial studies, this opposition continues Levinas' lament in the face of a word made of a saraband of countless equivalent uh, uh, cultures. Thus, the very first pages of l'Occident décroché, could be translated as the West unhooked, Occident unhooked, by anthropologist Jean-Louis Amsel, echo the notion that a disoccidentalized word is ipso facto a disoriented word, a word upside down witnessing, and I quote Jean-Luc Amsel, a supposed crumbling of the West with the concomitant competing rise of thoughts, of philosophies, which dispute to Europe and America their intention to dominate the world, 
which means, according to those who have for them nothing but contempt, questioning their pretension to universality. End of quote. This is quite a, uh, a sentence, the crumbling of the West, uh, Amsel evokes. And to paraphrase here Derrida himself paraphrasing Kant, I could make the observation that we are witnessing quite an apocalyptic tone recently adopted by many a French intellectual against the chaos word of the post-colonial. Amsel considers that the unhooking from the West which is, according to him, what post-colonial and subalternist studies amount to, means the fragmentation of the word into provinces, with the consequence that the untranslatable and what Barbara Cassin has claimed as a consistent relativism will reign supreme. Jean-Louis Amsel would admit that the machine de guerre against universalism could be justified in a phase of decolonization from a Europe which colonized the rest of the world precisely in the name of the universal. One could think here, for example, of the dramatic gesture of Aimé Césaire writing his famous letter to Maurice Thorez as he resigned from the French Communist Party. You know that in uh, uh, 1956, uh, following the events with uh, invasions uh, uh, by uh, the Soviet Union of Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, M. Césaire uh, uh, resigned from the French uh, Communist Party. He wrote uh, uh, a long letter, which was meant to be published, letter to Maurice Torres, a letter to Maurice Torres. Maurice Torres was the, then the Secretary General of the French Communist Party in which he basically said uh, 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 this. Uh, he denounced the crimes of, uh, uh, of Stalin and, and the Soviet uh, 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 Union, but above all, he said that he did not find that uh, communist fraternalism, the fraternalism of the French Communist Party, was much better than colonial paternalism, because, after all, the French Communist Party was founded upon the notion that it represented the universal class and that the universal class that the proletariat is, is going to bring universal emancipation. So you colonized people, you women, just wait for the universal class to bring emancipation and if so facto, everybody would be liberated. And somehow, somehow, even a philosopher such as Jean-Paul Sartre, who was very sympathetic with the movement of Negritude, did say the same thing. If you read his preface to the anthology published by Senghor uh, of uh, 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 black poetry, which he turned into a manifesto for Negritude just because of his flamboyant style in Black Orpheus, the preface he gave to the work, Sartre, in the end, just uh, 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 takes back the agency that he had given to the Negritude people by saying, well, Negritude itself, this demand for uh, uh, the liberation of the colonial people is a pure invention of poetry, just in the same way as Eurydice had been summoned out of Inferno by the very poetry of, of, of Orpheus, but she is bound to disappear in the daylight. In the same way, uh, this movement uh, uh, by Senghor and Césaire was bound to disappear once the universal class, which the proletariat is, takes things into its own hands. So I close that long parenthesis and Amsel would uh, uh, accept that in that particular context, uh, 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 this demand against uh, uh, the universalism represented by the Communist Party uh, would have a, a, a meaning. But that attitude, uh, Amsel continues, was valid then 
that is not justifiable anymore because now, and I quote Amsel, the prevailing situation in this beginning of 21st century is very different from that of the 1950s and 1960s. In the present context of clash of civilizations, or rather in what looks more and more like a crusades conflict, strategic essentialism, of course this is for my colleague and good friend Gayatri Spivak, strategic essentialism has become a problematic notion as the affirmation of a radical otherness can be perceived as the ferment of all fundamentalisms. In the world we are now living in, apparently open, but in reality perfectly compartmentalized, we must abandon any definition or assertion of identity that restrains the circulation of enunciations through cultural boundaries, in other words, makes those boundaries exist as such by reinforcing them. End of the, this long quote from uh, Amsel's L'Occident des Crochets. Let me say here that I am in agreement with Amsel. More than he has acknowledged in that book, I am among the people he uh, uh, discusses, I should say he disputes in the book, and more than one uh, uh, could conclude from just the public controversy which opposed us and which was staged when we were both interviewed on France Culture uh, in public by the excellent Adèle Van Riet during the Cito Philo Festival in Lille in 2014. I do not advocate uh, a word of fragments and insularities, and I have uh, uh, any as my witness. Uh, I do not advocate the untranslatable, but uh, what Emmanuel Wallerstein has called for after, I quote him, the era of European universalism, what he called a truly universal universalism and a language for, I quote uh, Wallerstein, for universalizing our particulars and particularizing our universal in an open-ended process that would allow us to find new synthesis. End of quote. I believe that such a truly universal universalism echoes Merleau-Ponty's lateral universal and that it is synonymous with translation. That is where I stand. Without the mediation of a universal grammar, as Levinas said, the possibility of a universal and horizontal circulation of enunciation is just translation. What Amsel is calling for, saying that he doesn't want a word of fragment because he wants a word in which enunciations can circulate universally, well, if we take that metaphor seriously, a circulation of enunciations universally, that is called translation. Now here is exactly what Merleau-Ponty says while foreseeing the new context of our colonial times. This is what Levinas was alluding to, this passage which I quote at length because it's important. The equipment of our social being can be dismantled and reconstructed by voyage as we are able to learn to speak other languages. This provides a second way to the universal, no longer the overarching universal of a strictly objective method, but a sort of lateral universal which we acquire through ethnological experience and its incessant testing of the self through the other person and the other person through the self. It is question of constructing a general system of reference in which the point of view of the native the point of view of the civilized man and the mistaken views each has of the other can all find a place, that is, of constituting a more comprehensive experience which becomes in principle accessible to men of a different time and country." Uh, end of quote. This was written by Merleau-Ponty in 1960 in uh, uh, one of the texts that were uh, 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 collected in the volume Signe, Science, translated into English in 1964. 
my first remark uh, uh, is the following. The point made by Levinas in a dismissive way that this is like learning another language from one's mother tongue as a definition of laterally universal is precisely what is stated here by Merleau-Ponty in a positive way. The call is made for the capacity to be in between languages, to be a translator. And that capacity is the lesson to be drawn for Merleau-Ponty from ethnology. It is important to note that the quote, uh, the citation I gave, comes from the text devoted by Merleau-Ponty to a reflection on ethnology and anthropology, and it is entitled From Moss to Claude uh, Lévi-Strauss. It is important, and this is my second remark, that the lateral universal as translation does not mean transparency and the elimination of the untranslatable. The view is not that of some sort of naive linguistic and cultural ecumenism. On the contrary, the untranslatable or the unavoidable misunderstandings or the mistaken views about each other, to take uh, Merleau-Ponty's phrase, are part of this incessant testing marked by the co-presence of many different views. So lateral universality does not have as its horizon uh, uh, the, the establishment of a universal grammar, nor the end game of a final reduction of the diversity of the chaos word to the one and the same. So what does it mean to learn to speak other languages, thus heeding the injunction from anthropology? This brings me to a uh, 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 second part of uh, my presentation. Speaking to philosophers from the point of view of an anthropologist precisely, an anthropologist and a linguist, Edouard Sapir had this advice for them. I quote him. Few philosophers have deigned to look into the morphologies of primitive languages, nor have they given the structural peculiarities of their own speech more than a passing and perfunctory attention. When one has the riddle of the universe on his hands, such pursuits seem tri trivial enough. Yet when it begins to be suspected that at least some solutions of the great riddle are elaborately roundabout applications of the rules of Latin or German or English grammar, the triviality of linguistic analysis becomes less certain to a far greater extent than the philosopher has realized, he is likely to become the dupe of his speech forms, which is equivalent to saying that the mold of his thought, which is typically a linguistic mold, is apt to be projected into his conception of the word. Thus, innocent linguistic categories may take on the formidable appearance of cosmic absolutes. If only, therefore, to save himself from philosophic verbalism, it would be well for the philosopher to look critically to the linguistic foundations and limitations of his thought." End of, of quote. Now, let me take as an illustration of this kind of linguistic turn. This is akin to what we would call a linguistic turn. A particular case evoked by Yvon Belaval as he precisely called the attention on the very languages in which the philosophers express themselves. This is a book he published a long time ago entitled Les Philosophes et leur Langage. Here is the example. In his Traité des Systèmes, 18th century French philosopher Étienne Bonneau, Abbé de Condillac, critically analyzes an argument made by the late 17th century Cartesian philosopher, Nicolas Malbranche. A general feature, we know that a general feature of uh, uh, mm, sensationalist or empiricist criticism of uh, rationalist and innate uh, uh, 
philosophers is usually to accuse them of verbalism in the sense that they would invoke as uh, real entities uh, uh, things that are in fact the sheer production of uh, uh, the uh, inventive creative power of language beyond what is actually the state of affairs, beyond what is uh, given. This is one general feature of uh, such criticism. Here, in this particular case, uh, 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 it is different. But the, this idea that you have to, to just uh, um, denounce these, the, this kind of crazy, mad, uh, generative power of language is something that we find in uh, um, uh, Condiac's criticism. As the French phrase expresses it well, the criticism is that these rationalist and innaist philosophers se pay de mots, literally reward themselves with words. Now, here, the criticism uh, uh, of, from uh, um, Condiac is aimed at a particular aspect of Malbranche's core thesis that the ultimate cause of everything is God. So that what we call causes, in the plural, are only occasions for God's unique agency. We could say, for example, that uh, the fire, that fire burns, uh, or God burns through the occasion of uh, 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 fire. And we could say also that uh, when uh, Diego Maradona cheated and scored a goal with his hand for Argentina, he was absolutely right and occasionally saying that it was the hand of God. <laughs> One crucial objection against occasionalism, as the system is known, is then raised if God is the general cause of all natural inclinations to be found in our minds, how can we account for the possibility of sin? For Malbranche, the answer to such an objection takes the form of an analogy between the principle of inertia as a natural law of physics and what happens when our natural inclinations are deviated in the direction of wrongdoing. Condillac stresses that this is an aspect of the general analogy established earlier by Malbranche between matter's capacity to receive movement, our understanding's capacity to receive ideas, in particular innate ideas as they are imprinted in us by, uh, upon us by God, and uh, uh, the will's capacity to receive inclinations, which for Condillac manifests that contrarily to his claim, the Cartesian priest that Malbranche is has no clear and distinct idea of the notion of will, since its explanation is by analogy. This is the ultimate Cartesian test, right? Clear and distinct idea is uh, uh, what makes me know that I am uh, really thinking something. Malbranche's answer to the objection of sin is the following. I quote Malbranche. In the same way that all movements follow a straight line if they do not encounter some extraneous and particular cause that determine them and change them into curved lines by opposing them, all inclinations that we received from God are straight and could not have any other end than the possession of the good and the truth and the true. Were it not for some extraneous cause which would determine what was impressed upon us by nature towards bad ends. End of quote. And this is the passage that Condillac himself quotes, and to which he simply responds, what would have Malbranche done if that metaphorical expression, straight inclinations, had not been in French? I will not examine the discussion in any detail, as this is not what is at stake here. What I'm interested in are the following, the following two points. First, uh, 
Condillac calls Malbranche's attention to the fact that he is speaking French and that the peculiarities of that language incline him to think according to the possibility that the language offers. But there is nothing necessary and universal in those linguistic accidents by definition. If philosophy does not leave anything unexamined, that is its basic definition, we need to pay attention to the fact that a given language in which we happen to philosophize inclines us to be led by words to think in a certain unexamined way. Second point is implicit in Condillac's criticism. The implication is an invitation to always translate. That is to always test our arguments by transferring them into another language, that is the etymological meaning of transducere, to lead trans dia, uh, via, or uh, across. To, so to transfer them into another language, be it simply virtual, in order to measure how sound they are in a way that would mean independently from the particular language we think in. So Condillac is in some respect asking Malbranche to translate his statement into a language in which straight cannot be used in the metaphorical sense upon which it rests. Of course, that does not mean actually performing the translation. And as I said, the other language can be simply virtual. Thanks God, because uh, after all, being monolingual is widespread even among non-American philosophers. <laughs> the injunction is just about being aware that there are out there many languages where the peculiar use of straight is absent. I would like to generalize this into the following memento. Think in the presence of the plurality of languages. In other words, remember that to philosophize is to speak a language among languages and that what you say should undergo the test of translation, the test of the foreign, to use Antoine Berman's title. Edouard Glissant famously declared, j'écris en présence de toutes les langues du monde. I write in the presence of all the languages of the world. In a way, that is what Condillac's criticism amounts to. And this is the posture that Merleau-Ponty's notion of lateral universal invites philosophers to adopt. Of course, philosophers have always known that the curse of Babel happened and, and that there are many languages. But there is also among them a strong belief in the necessary existence of the logos, that is both reason and language, ratio et oratio, as the Latins rightly translated the, word, the Greek word logos. To philosophize is to speak logos and establish one's separation from the languages of the barbarians. When the plurality of languages is considered, it is still to ask if the logos, the language of philosophy, can be incarnated in one of those given languages. It is within such a framework that the Heideggerian concept of a historical language and his notion that philosophy speaks Greek, used to speak Greek and now it speaks German, are to be understood. Cicero's premise that philosophy can also speak Latin is still a tribute paid to the notion of a language of philosophy. After all, when in his book, uh, 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 De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum, he starts looking at the best ways to translate this Greek concept into Latin, etc., his idea is to convince his own compatriots that they could philosophize also in their own language, which is a way of saying our language can also be a language of the Logos, can also be an incarnation of the Logos. In other words, you are not destroying the Logos, you are reinforcing it by paying tribute to, him, to it through your own uh, uh, translation. 
This is different from the notion that I use in my work, which has been coined by Barbara Cassin, of philosophizing in tongues, a biblical expression which takes seriously our post babelian condition and which conveys the double idea that, first, before they are concepts, our concepts are words. They are words in languages. Ce sont des mots en langue, inscribed in languages. Second, if universal there is, and I'm here quoting Barbara, Barbara Cassin, if universal there is, I'm not sure that the word is adequate. She is the one who adds that. It is not an overarching one, but a lateral one, and its name is translation. In fact, when she writes that sentence that I just quoted, Barbara Cassin is uh, alluding, is making a reference uh, to my own identification of the lateral universal uh, of Merleau-Ponty with uh, translation. There is one uh, fundamental difference between uh, my good friend Barbara Cassin and myself. She believes in the untranslatable. She believes in what she calls a consistent relativism. And having been a student of Louis Althusser, I am fundamentally a universalist. I do want something like the universal to, 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 to happen. That would be the difference between the two of us. So this is why she says, uh, I'm not sure that the word is adequate. And if there is a universal, it can only be uh, 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 um, lateral. Because I am uh, 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 among those who work uh, with, uh, in her project within the framework established by her dictionary of the untranslatables, those she refers to in her uh, introduction of these and intraduisibles, as I quote her, the 150 companions and friends for the journey of more than 10 years who explored another kind of freedom and philosophical practice at once more global and diversified, connected with words, with words in languages. I, End of quote. I did not realize until I read it right now that she also has this quite apocalyptic tone <laughs> in describing what we are doing. The assumption shared by those companions beyond the divide between universalist and relativist is that there is no logos standing in its separation and in its vertical universality. With the example of Condillac and his criticism of Malbranche, one isolated word was considered. The question of translation is expanded. When we consider philosophical statements, as they involve the very grammar of a language and not just the particular use of some words. Being is, not being is not, or I think, therefore I am, are such statements, for example. Translation between Indo-European languages can be problematic. It is even more so when we are considering a non-Indo-European language. In particular, zero copula languages, as they are called by uh, linguists, languages where you do not have the verb to be functioning the way in which it functions in Greek or English or Latin or French, when dealing with those kind of ontological statements. When Descartes says, I am, I exist, Ex establishing an equivalence between the two, I am and I exist, how do we translate his statement in a language where the absolute use of the verb to be does not work or does not work in the same way? When you say I am in certain languages, people would expect you to say you are what? You are who? You are where? You are how big? Does your mother know about your whereabouts? No. <laughs> Scrap that. <laughs> this, I can't resist. This Rwandan philosopher, Alexis Kagame, uh, has declared in his La Philosophie Bantu Rwandaise de Lettres that one could not translate Descartes' cogito ergo sum into Kenya Rwandan language. In fact, there is always a way of rendering it. But the point he is making is that realizing that I am is an untranslatable could have opened up the question of the very possibility of making an immediate move from I think to I am 
which is precisely a criticism that will be leveled at Descartes' cogito. So now I end with a very short third point on uh, the opposition, the difference between logical analysis of language and philosophizing in tongues. But asking this question, is this, what I've just said, uh, this call for translation, the same as conducting a logical analysis of language according to the Leibnizian program of overcoming the saraband of our post babel word by learning to go beyond the surface grammar of our languages and retrieve the true grammar of thought or of understanding. That grammar is the one that Leibniz called philosophical and of which he believed that it would be universal. For Leibniz, such a philosophical grammar of thought, and therefore the universal grammar, the universal language, sorry, is the language of algebra, or rather the speciosa, as he called it. And the task of reconstructing the philosophical grammar of all our languages offers a path back to the Adamic uh, uh, language, the pre babel condition of homoloquax. This task is clearly assumed by two hairs of Leibniz's program of a lingua caracteristica universalis and of a calculus ratiocinator, George Bull and Gottlob Frege. Bull, for example, writes, we could not easily conceive that the unnumbered tongues and dialects of the earth should have preserved through the long succession of ages so much that is common and universal were we not assured of the existence of some deep foundation of their agreement in the laws of the mind itself, end of quote. The analogy could be made between the idea of going deep down to the laws of the mind and reconstruct philosophically the language in which all is already translated and Walter Benjamin's pure language. Logicians following Leibniz were also looking for the language of all languages, the language of our agreement that would turn disputatio into calculemus. Any kind of dispute would be settled by uh, calculus. Philosophi philosophizing in tongues on the other side means establishing oneself comfortably in our post babelian condition. It is not the research for the philosophical grammar of our language, but it finds its starting point in the inescapable reality of the grammatical philosophies or philosophies of grammar present in our empirical languages, a concept that you have recognized as coined by Nietzsche, who considered grammar the conceptual matrix of metaphysics. And I'm here referring to the famous uh, uh, um, Article 20, from Beyond Good and Evil, where Nietzsche uh, uh, says philosophizing in so, is so far an atavism of the highest order. The wonderful family resemblance of all Indian, Greek, and German philosophizing is easily enough explained. Uh, uh, where there is affinity of languages owing to the common philosophy of grammar, uh, uh, I mean owing to the unconscious domination and guidance of similar grammatical functions, it cannot be that everything is prepared at the outset for a similar development and succession of philosophical systems, just as the way seems bad against certain other possibilities of word interpretations. It is highly probable, uh, Nietzsche continues, that philosophers within the domain of the Ural Altaic languages where the conception of the subject is least developed, look otherwise into the word and will be found on path of thought different from those of the Indo-Germans and Muslims. The spell of certain grammatical functions is ultimately the spell of physiological valuations and racial conditions. So much by way of rejecting Locke's superficiality with regard to the origin of ideas. Well known quote. Uh, from Nietzsche, which echoes obviously what I just read concerning Edward Sapir. Now I conclude by coming back to Levinas. Lateral universality is not to be dismissed in the name of verticality. It is not a contradiction in adjecto and therefore an empty phrase. 
Its meaning is translation. The language of all languages, as Kenyan writer Ngugi Wachongo declares, is translation. And this could echo also what uh, Umberto Eco said when he said that the language of Europe is translation. In fact, we can just expand this to the whole world and say, like Ngugi, that the language of all languages is translation and not a logos identified with Greek or German or English. That is the invitation expressed in the journey of the Dictionary of the Untranslatables to discover that every language is always une langue entre autres, a language among others. That leads me to a pedagogical utopia to end. We know that the pediment of Plato's academy said, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. The new academy of the 21st century global world may ask, let no one ignorant of a radically other tongue than his own enter here. After all, Goethe, who was discussed last week in Elie's paper, said that one who does not know but one's own tongue, in fact, does not know it. That is, for Merleau-Ponty, the significance of lateral universality, a lesson to be drawn from anthropology. And he indicates that Husserl himself, at one point when he received the book from Levi Brühl on primitive mentality, understood the necessity to pay attention to other languages and life forms to anthropology that he had decried as all other social sciences uh, in his work. That we have to learn how to think from language to language or between languages is the significance of lateral universality. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, about about Kandiyak, you, you're absolutely right. I, I, I do not endorse the idea that if you know by analogy, you have no uh, real idea, because sometimes that's the only way of knowing precisely, to say that x is to y, what z is to d, is if you know the other terms, uh, knowing exactly what the unknown is. That is how you progress from the known to the unknown as well. But Condillac has a point here. If you are a Cartesian philosopher, and Malbranche is a Cartesian philosopher, you do not accept anything less as a cri criterion of evidence than this uh, grasping, uno intuitu, grasping by one single act of, uh, of the mind, the, the, the truth of the thing. If you cannot look at the will and grasp intuitively uh, what it means and have a clear and distinct idea of the significance of the will. If you need to take the detour of saying that the will is to the inclinations it receives what matter is to the movement it receives, then 
you are not being a good Cartesian philosopher. I, you and I are not having that kind of, of uh, demand for clear and distinct ideas because you and I are very approximative people who like poetry and believe that we live in an approximative world anyway. So, uh, uh, yeah. And, and why did I say, why didn't I say that in the other part of your question, it is the best metaphor, and I insisted on this identification of the lateral universal and, 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 and translation, uh, because what I have done is already a kind of metonymic reduction of cultures to languages. I don't want to talk about relationship between cultures because I don't know what that means. I mean, it is very fashionable to talk about dialogue of cultures or dialogue of religions, but nobody has ever seen uh, cultures or religions sitting together and discussing. But you can have people, real people, sitting together and using languages and using languages with all the capacity of misunderstanding that is involved in language and so on, so forth. And that is why I proceed with more than just saying it is a metaphor, and I, um, I use the strong identification uh, uh, in, instead. Thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, the question of translation takes on a whole new meaning when thought of through the notion of prayer, right? Um, prayer is seen as something, not just that you have to be able to speak the original language, but it, you speak the original language because you're sending God's words back to God, so to speak. Um, Malbranche famously defined prayer in terms of attention, right? He said that attention is a natural prayer of the soul, uh, which I think is what makes him a Cartesian, right? Because that's what Descartes was interested in as well. Because the, the cogito was more of an intuitive insight precisely because it was the development of attention that came via this intuitive moment of clear and distinction. Um, in that way, could attention be thought of as the universal language rather than translation? Yes, except that in this case, attention would be rather the universal silence than the universal language. It would be universal precisely because it is a, a radical moment of, of silence. This, this silence even in, in prayer, when Malbranche says that attention, uh, and, and attention, as you know, is a very strong concept in, uh, in Cartesian uh, philosophy. When Descartes says that the ideas that are clear and distinct appear as such to an attentive mind, this is precisely the mind that has bracketed out in some kind of epoche everything else and which is just fixated on the presence, the overwhelming presence of the idea. And there is almost something religious in, in, in that notion of an attention. And it is not uh, surprising then that Malbranche, who is a priest, takes Descartes' notion of attention to that point where it becomes the true only possible prayer that you can address God. The only way of praying God should be through absolute uh, 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 silence. You, you pray God and you send to him words, uh, and usually his own words, when he is this deus absconditus, some kind of behind the veil, you don't really uh, 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 see him, you don't really are not sure he is there. Then you send him all your all your possible rabbana, or oh my lord, etc., etc. But if you are in his presence, there is nothing you are going to ask. Okay? Normally, you shouldn't be asking anything at all. Only in the, in the belief that God is the absent God, Deus absconditus, could you, you know, pray and say, uh, oh my God, uh, help me with my PhD and my writing. <laughs> and stuff like that. In his presence, you are not going to ask for anything at all. And this is probably the highest form of, 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 of prayer, uh, just uh, having the sense of your own ontological poverty and the way in which that ontological poverty is fulfilled by uh, God's being himself. Um, thank you so much. So my question, is kind of 
frustrated around three things. One is when you mentioned your difference uh, with, uh, uh, um, with uh, the consistent relativism of Barbara. Um, I would love, because yours is a very different solution, uh, and yet you just slid that in, but I think <laughs> if, if you were to have to talk with her philosophically about this, I would love to know how it goes. That's the first part of the question. The second part is um, the, um, the fungibility of translation you know, whether one can talk not just about cultural translation, but for me the question is historical translation. How do you not colonize a past period of time, and how do you allow it, uh, uh, know that you are involved in active translation, not an active appropriation, which is not really our history, whether it's a religious history or national history or Western history, but it's really hard to do because you've got to translate. Um, and so that kind of, you could call it met metaphorical use of the word translate. How, you know, when does a metaphor break down? When, because in fact, I do find that like, we were discussing often this word stasis, which in uh, a Greek has this strange combination of standing, but also revolution, uh, uh, or rebellion. And so it seems to be full of motion and yet at the same time, so static. And it's a very, very important uh, concept uh, in that cultural situation. So so that's kind of, so I don't think that excludes language. And so it's not just a, a nice metaphor, but I wondered how you would respond to that. And then the third thing, and also it's connected, uh, is when you um, talk about Benin's uh, idea of pure language. Um, yes, it could be this pure and therefore you know, totally erroneous language, or if what allows for the theological, it could be another way of saying, and here I'm going to translate, uh, what the Quran says, and I may be wrong now to remember, but I think it's uh, chapter 40, or stanza, whatever it's, 47, 13, I think that's it. But I know that it says, um, O oh people, I have made you man and woman, and of various nations, let's say, languages, so that you may get to know one another. You quoted it right. Indeed, the Quran does say, I've made you uh, um, different nations so that you may know uh, each other, which is, let me start with that aspect of your, of your question which is actually something that goes in the direction of what I'm uh, uh, calling for in some respect. Because I do believe, and this is the kind of verses from the Quran that I emphasize myself, I do believe in pluralism. One, one, uh, one correspondent, one um, echo to this quote that you just uh, uh, made from the Quran is also another passage of the Quran where it says, if we had so wanted, we would have made you one single nation. Understood, we did not want it. But uh, uh, we made you uh, uh, different in your colors and in your languages and even in your spiritual orientation, traditions, and religions, etc. any kind of uh, diversity that one could imagine. And it says, it, says, it continues saying, uh, uh, what you should be doing then is to compete in good deeds, knowing that when you come back to me, God, I am the one who is going to tell you about your divergences. Th so this idea that pluralism is in the order of things, is something wanted, and something which has to be as it is, and it is something good. And that then you have to translate. You have to compete, but you compete in good deeds. And what you are left with is precisely translation from the diversity of your languages, all equivalent languages, the countless, the saraband of countless equivalent languages that Levinas did not uh, 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 want to fragment 
the, the world, that the only way of having a kind of perspective above all our divergences and our differences is the point of view of God himself. It is only when you come back to me that you will understand who was right or what nature, what was the nature of your own differences. If you take that kind of verses seriously, then you are a pluralist. But, and I connect this to your first question, I believe that pluralism is some kind of middle between universalism, abstract universalism, and relativism, be it a consistent one. The idea that plurality and pluralism is not the negation of something, of the claim for something true, and uh, uh, is something that I try to formulate. It's very, it's a in-between position, and like all in-between positions, it is a, a, a difficult one. And this is the conversation I am actually having with Barbara. This is something we discuss any time uh, 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 we, we, we meet. And, uh, uh, and uh, for example, if you consider the, the work of the untranslatable, as I said, when Kenyan Rwandan philosopher Alexis Kagame says, well, uh, uh, I think therefore I am is untranslatable in Kenya Rwanda, one can understand exactly what he is saying. He is saying that you do not have this absolute use of the verb to be in his own Kenya Rwandan language. And, but you have many other languages where you don't have it. In Hebrew, you don't say being is not being is not. You just say, well, being is, well, and there is no nothingness, something like that. But if you have to translate the poem of Parmenides, you can manage. Actually, the poem of Parmenides ends up being translatable in all uh, languages. And I quoted Edward Sapir. Uh, uh, my friends in my seminar and myself were laughing at the fact that Edward Sapir thinks, actually, that Kant should have been an Eskimo because <laughs> he thought that Eskimo language was much more appropriate for the expression of what he has to say uh, uh, than, than, than German. So much for the historical language of Heidegger. So, uh, 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 yes, so translation is this impossible task that in the end always succeeds. That's what I would like to, 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 to have as being my, uh, my, my, my position because in it is involved uh, what Paul Ricoeur has called this work of mourning, but at the same time, uh, you, you do the job. When you start translating, it is impossible for you to translate, and in the end, you do the job. Now, how are you going to do it? And you, you, you know, of course, about the, uh, the Bermanian uh, reflection coming from Schleimacher about uh, serving two masters. Are you going to bring the word to the reader? or the reader to the work? Are you going to displace the reader or try to make him stay comfortably in his own language in which you are going to uh, uh, transfer what you, what, you, what you translate? I believe this is connected with what you, talk about, uh, you say about historical translation. If I want some kind of modern adaptation of, of, of Milton, and I ask Adam's permission to, uh, to say such a, such a an enormity uh, here, I could do that. I mean, it could be fun to have Paradise Lost uh, uh, resembling Kanye West's rap, <laughs> but uh, uh, that would not be uh, uh, really what you want to do. But historicizing, and the historicity is, is, I believe, the historicity adds to the dimension of, of translation, which is just that, uh, bringing the reader to the text, to the work, or the work to the reader, if it is at a certain time, uh, you have this distance in, in time, you may want, if you translate Shakespeare in, in Wolof, to have an old state of the, of the Wolof language to match uh, 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 Shakespeare's uh, language. But these are decisions you have, you have to, to make. It is the very crux of, of, of translation, as you, as you uh, know better. Stasis, when, you, when we had that conversation about stasis, stasis, it was very 
uh, interesting. And, and I want to go back to Reed and Gamben on, 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 on that, because I don't see how one could reconcile these two meanings of stasis standing on the one hand and civil war on the other hand. One question that I would like to ask, and I return it to you, do we absolutely, in fact, I haven't read uh, Agamben's text on that, but do we absolutely need to reconcile these two? In other words, if you have a dictionary which says that this root or this word could mean A and B, why do you have to work out a logic that would connect A and B? I encountered, I, let, me, let me finish this and then I'll ask you the question. I encountered this very uh, 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 question when I looked at the root, the Arabic root for translation, ra-ja-ma, which has given the word tarjuman, a, a translator, and which is also a word that uh, went into French as trishma. When in French you say trishma, it is an Arabic word, in fact. It could sound Latin, but it is an Arabic word, uh, 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 this Arabic word, tarjuman. And the interesting thing with trishma is that once traduction was adopted to mean translation, trishma had a very specialized use uh, as a simple, simple tool. You say par le truchement de, that is al uh, almost always the, ex the, the phrase in which you use it, and it has lost its meaning as translation. But uh, this is a very long digression. My point is that the same root, rajama, which you find in Tarjuman translation, is a root for someone being lapidated. The Satan in, in the Quran is called Rajim, Shaitan Rajim. The, the lapidated, Satan, the lapidated. What in the heck is the connection between lapidated and translation? If I, I could spend the rest of my life looking at a connection or just decide, like Hegel said we should say in the face of mountains, it is so. <laughs> Rajama means translation on the one hand, and on the other hand, the lapidated. Even though you know there might be language, but 
really better understanding per se, and sort of uh, uh, like a radical separation of this is an example in which grammatical differences are not connected to differences in, in the content of experience at all per se. So I'm wondering if uh, if sort of maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit because precisely because for me uh, there is a certain sense in which. Uh, like a, like a, 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 horizontal, a horizontal sort of understanding of language is so intertwined with uh, an understanding of the question of the other in general, whether, whether it is the anthropological other in ethnology or whether it is the philosophical other in the other, that there is some sense in which they can't be so separated. No, I mean, this is, this is a wonderful and, and uh, crucial, crucial question you are posing. Somehow I have it easy by uh, this metronymic reduction of culture to language. I'm really looking at languages and all my language is about languages. And uh, uh, not considering the whole uh, uh, cultural package that comes with the whole thing. So. Uh, uh, Yes, I, I concentrate on, for example, the, the way in which both Sapir and, and, and Nietzsche uh, do on, on the grammar uh, of a given language. What does a grammar say? What, what, what do you do when you do not have, when you are dealing with a zero copula language and so on? But you are right, what could also say that in the process of translation, you try, trying to put yourself in the shoes of the other is not just, you know, uh, uh, having this navigation between two different uh, grammatical philosophies, to use Nietzsche's concept, but also worldviews, cultures, and so on. I would have the kind of answer that uh, uh, you and I and our other uh, 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 companions in the seminar have been considering when we read Quine, this notion of you know, practical psychology and empathy, the notion that empathy, what, what was uh, uh, labeled an expression that I don't like, the principle of charity, but which for which probably empathy that uh, Quine uses in, uh, in his uh, uh, latest works uh, is, is better. So uh, to what extent do we do, 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 does that uh, uh, count? is a, a question I, I, I pose myself, and I don't have a, a, a precise answer to offer here. Uh, the experience of l reading a translation, a work in translation, which is obviously displacing me, decentering me. It is speaking to me in the language that I can read, because that is what the translation is about. But at the same time, I can feel not only in the way in which the sentences are, are, are written, but also references that are made, that there is a whole word behind these words that I'm, that I'm reading, and to what extent do I enter that word is a very uh, important, interesting question. Which, by the way, we tried to, to raise in our meeting when we read Birago Diop, who is obviously bringing with him all this wall of culture, and if you read him, I was, we were one wall of and a half, and I count Ellen and half, uh, if she would allow me, in, in the class, but uh, we all read the same text in, in, in some respect. But this is uh, uh, not something that you can decide generally. I don't think there is a kind of general universal discourse about what you just raised. It is something that uh, is decided on a case by case basis. In what sense does this translation do the job of also bringing to me not only a language, but also a world view? Uh, uh, 
form of modified uh, you know, JPP and, and seriously at the same time the discussion of one more, more than one language, more than one language. Uh, um, also, I think uh, the Inda would have occurred with the criticism of the Inas. Uh, if in fact he has labeled uh, similar criticism, he has addressed uh, similar criticisms to the Inas. So, uh, since you made explicit your, you know, your dialogue and your, and your difference with uh, uh, with Papa Hassan, I was wondering, you know, it seems to me that there is here an ongoing dialogue, even though it's unspoken. If it died, I'd like you to more. Uh, you are 1,000 times uh, right. It is true that, in fact, if I, if I were to, 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 to publish my, 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 my presentation today, I would put as an epigraph, on ne parle qu'une seule langue, on ne parle jamais une seule langue, on ne parle jamais qu'une seule langue, which is the Deridian uh, 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 well-known uh, 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 phrases. And in this case, Obviously, I would think that uh, uh, Derrida is very much present in what I was saying, and as he is present in, in, in Barbara Cassin's uh, uh, work, uh, by, by the way. So yes, I I indeed, you are absolutely right pointing that. My only line of defense would be to say, uh, I was kind of breathing Derrida so naturally that he was uh, very much present in what I was in what I was saying, and 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 but did not come out uh, um, uh, thematized as as such. If I had considered, because I was going to consider that aspect, but I was already being too long, uh, this idea that intra linguistic translation is perfectly possible, which is what he what he himself uh, 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 said in his dialogue with Khatibi on the monolinguism uh, uh, de l'autre. And, uh, and there are also passages in his uh, dialogue, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with Ellen Sixus, uh, where uh, um, the issue of language and of translation also is uh, very much uh, uh, echoing what I was saying. Yeah. But I was wondering you know, because the question is, uh, you know, how you tie to universality or universalism, and I thought that maybe, you know, you said um, you disagree with Baba Agassin you know, within the common framework, within the common framework of translation, you know, because you, you believe in a, a, a kind of a plural universality as opposed to the system of that, you know, activism. And so I was wondering where you would situate, you know, the Lida in this question. Uh, uh, well, I, I think that I am more on the side, what I'm saying is probably more on the side of, of Derrida, I, 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 I believe. Uh, I'm thinking here, uh, uh, saying, uh, saying that to, um, well, first of all, uh, everything that I uh, uh, said about the, 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 this logos, the language of languages, but at the same time, the notion that uh, we have this horizon of uh, the task of universality. In other words, f uh, universality is not a given. You ha we have not such a thing as an overarching universal, but we still have the, the task and the horizon of looking for some form of universalization. Actually, the, 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 the verb of action, the action of universalizing, would be probably something I would like to, to, consider, to consider more. One concrete example would be uh, the discourse on human rights. What does it mean that when these nations, 58 nations, met in UNESCO in 1948, they had a declaration which demands for its own universalization, for its own, the, the circulation of those enunciations, to use the language of Amsel, through all different languages and, and, uh, and cultures, which is a very interesting point. I mean, this would be the kind of concrete example that uh, uh, Swayam was, was asking for uh, earlier, because I have seen translation of the Universal Declaration in Wolof, uh, 
depending on the word you choose to say, for example, rights, you are doing things that are very different. You have two ways of saying rights in, in Wolof. One is the old uh, Wolof phrase for that uh, 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 warugar, what, what, you can, what you can demand. Another word is just the adoption of the Arabic uh, word because uh, Arabic language is very present in many uh, African languages through uh, Islamization and hybridization of the, of the languages is to use haq. Uh, uh, so if you s use the, the, the word haq, then all the connotation, the religious connotations also come with it because haq, to come back to the kind of etymology that we were discussing with Suzanne, means also not only right, but true and so on. So depending on which word you use for that translation, you are implying many different connotations in your uh, translation of the declaration. This is the kind of aspects I am very much interested in. Uh, uh, how translation uh, is transformative, which is something you fi we find also in Benjamin. For Benjamin, the act of translation transforms both languages, the target one and the and the, and the source uh, uh, language. But thank you for calling my attention on the issue. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, could, could, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between um, horizontal universalism and vertical uh, universalism. How is it that your notion of a horizontal universal uh, interacts or, or yields to the of a uh, history of translation that has been as tools of colonization. Um, and so I'm thinking of, um, I believe her name is Lapachilla, who was the indigenous um, translator who Cortez used in his um, encounter with Montezuma. And so I'm wondering how it is that translation uh, might occasion a possible, not a communication, but a possibility of decoding um, so as to kind of um, extract. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, yeah. about that aspect of translation, but also how it would yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you are using that example of the translator of Cortese because this is something I'm very much interested in, the, 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 the colonial interpreter, the one who in a, in, a, in a given colonial space or a space of domination is supposed to be the one who conveys the orders of the master and also uh, uh, um, uh, gives him uh, the information that he would need to, to do. Uh, so in this case, and I come back to the word trishma, the interpreter is supposed to be simply a trishma, which never happens actually. They always take some kind of agency. I'm sure that the translator of Cortese took it on his own also to sort of do more than just interpret uh, uh, things. But on the laterality and the universality, let me give you, to make it more precise, uh, something that uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty said and that I just alluded to. Husserl, as you know, is someone who just did not believe in anthropology, anything. I mean, after the radical criticism of Frege, uh, Husserl got rid of anything uh, uh, having to do with some kind of psychological consideration. You have to deal with the eidos in, it, in, it, in itself and uh, uh, when you talk about truth or the phenomenological approach of things, you put between bracket, you bracket out everything that is not just the relationship of the transcendental subject and the object as it is constructed in this uh, phenomenological uh, uh, relation. So nothing having to do with anthropology. Anthropology is just some kind of distraction from the universality of that kind of relationship that you can have with the object. Uh, it itself in this uh, uh, relation with the ego transcendental. Now, uh, in 1935, which is exactly the same date where um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Husserl gave the Vienna conference that I alluded to, this is when he had this exchange with, with uh, Levi Brühl, who sent him his book on uh, primitive mentality, and Husserl, in writing had a very, uh, had a fairly long response saying that he should be in fact uh, 
that he was realizing that you cannot just de deduct, so to say, deduce the other f life forms by some kind of variation uh, within your own uh, uh, transcendental experience. You cannot just retrieve what humanity is and what human condition is by just having this kind of eidetic variation uh, uh, in, is in your own. You have at one point to deal with uh, uh, the, the plurality in the world, the actual plurality in the world. This is a moment when Husserl seemed to say, well, I have to pay more attention to anthropology because there is something that is not just something that I can uh, draw a conclusion uh, uh, from my own premises remaining in this uh, uh, strictly uh, uh, um, eidetic type of, of reduction. Having to go out there in the anthropological world is something that seemed uh, uh, important to the point when Merleau-Ponty said that this text by Husserl should be uh, really emphasized in the coming uh, publication of collected works by Husserl that was uh, going out at, at, at the time. So this notion of laterality means just that. You cannot uh, uh, know, fully know, if at one point you do not deal in the material way, in a material way, in a concrete way, with the plurality of, of, of the word. And that plurality cannot be reduced to the logical uh, or phenomenological categories and, 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 and be uh, concluded uh, 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 from those uh, uh, categories. And in the, in the particular case of colonialism, it means that you do not have anymore a culture that would present itself as universal, which would say, I am naturally the universal, you have to orient yourself towards me which is what Husserl said in that 1935 uh, 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 conference, which is also what somehow Levinas is, is saying when he laments that a decolonized word is also a disoriented uh, uh, word. This is very, very uh, French, by the way. Uh, you know, Valéry famously said, we French have the particularity of being universal. And I, I'm afraid this was not a joke <laughs> from him. <laughs> we might introduce it. Yeah. Uh, I should like to know, to hear your commentary about the sentence or formula uh, that uh, Herman Melville wrote to Nathaniel Hawthorne. He wrote uh, this, this uh, formula. I did not write. Moby Dick in English. I wrote it in Outlandish. Outlandish. Which Emmanuel Guerin translated La langue du grand ailleurs. Language from great outside. And um, it's from a point of view of poetry or literature. Do you think that's mean that in the desire to be universal, Herman Melville? thought he was not translatable, untranslatable. And um, I, my question also is, could we think that each language has a specific economy of silence? And that when we are desiring or learning a new language, it's uh, very often to to overcome the silence of our language. This is a question of proposition. And in the same way, I was thinking about what, uh, the question of Jacques Lacan. What is the language of the unconscious? And in, the, in this perspective, he tried, I tried to learn Chinese with Francois Chen, as you know. During two years, Lacan tried to speak Chinese, write Chinese, understand Chinese, thinking, desiring, hoping that Chinese could be the language for the unconscious. <laughs> After two years, 
<laughs> gave up and decided to go to mathematics and mathem and all the figures, you know. And I, I'm not sure that it was really successful. <laughs> but uh, I want to give another sentence of Lacan. Uh, would say we we said that we wrote that what is to be heard in what is this said that we listen that could be written. That's a enigmatic sentence with three levels. What is heard, what I am hearing, in what it is said that I could written. I could write, sorry, that I could write. Uh, asking the question of no, the translation of the, the language of the unconscious, but also the transmission of the knowledge about what he, he was listening during the psychoanalytic yeah. cure. So that's two questions for translation. Poetry and psychoanalysis, language yeah. and unconscious, and right. um, yeah. the question about silence and, and translating of Moby Dick. <laughs> Moby Dick, outlandish. Yeah, these are very difficult. These are very difficult questions, and thank you for the comments they constitute. I would suspect that uh, the Lacan, Lacan's uh, uh, statement that I, I did not know that one. Uh, it seems to uh, uh, paraphrase um, the old Aristotelian hierarchy between sounds as uh, they are the closest to the mental to the mental uh, image, and then the written uh, about which Derrida uh, writes in, in in grammatology. By the way, this notion that the, the, the oral logos, the, the word of God, is there, and then what is closest to it is obviously our own mental representation, which we express through sounds, and writing is derived, it's just a sign of sign, as it uh, a trace of, what, uh, of that. I think that uh, in these three layers uh, that Lacan is uh, uh, presenting, it is a, a kind of evocation of, of, of that. Now, about poetry and writing in outlandish, I do think that um, there is some form of pursuit of something universal in the way in which the language becomes poetic or goes back to its original uh, 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 poetry. Maybe it is not the logician who is looking for the universal language in the uh, uh, mathematical science of algebra who is right. And by the way, uh, this uh, infatuation uh, with uh, uh, Chinese language in Lacan is a way of uh, you know, repeating this, the admiration that the Leibnizian program had for the Chinese, not language in this case, but writing. The idea that, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, picturing immediately ideas, uh, the hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic uh, writing was somehow, could be somehow superior to, uh, to uh, the alphabetical uh, 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 writing. But in this, in this matter, I think that when it comes to, to Learning Chinese uh, in the case of Lacan was an excellent thing. This would uh, go along the lines of my own pedagogical utopia. Everybody should be thinking, learning a language radically different from their own language. And philosophize the way, for, for example, Francois Julien does. Francois Julien is, uh, is, is very good at looking at philosophem uh, 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 in between languages, in between Chinese, not only Chinese and French, but also the classical languages that, uh, uh, that he knows. To come back to poetry, uh, uh, the point when uh, uh, the language that poetry is after uh, 
uh, is that fundamentally poetic language which could reach a point when you could even say that it almost doesn't need uh, uh, translation as it becomes so close to, 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 to music. We may want to go in that, in, in that direction. Well, for that reason, poetry is at the same time probably the, what is most difficult to, 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 to translate. But, uh, uh, and at the same time, maybe the most uh, universal language. If I did not know English and you just recite uh, with some kind of melodious voice, it was long and long ago in a kingdom by the sea, there lived a maiden whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. I could just be there and just take in the musicality of what you are saying and listen to it like I listened to, to opera and Michal gave me authorization not to pay attention to the words, but to just have uh, the opera come uh, uh, in. Uh, Hans? Yeah, thank you, Bashir. That, that was wonderful. I had only one moment of, uh, not sadness, but uh, puzzlement, because I, I was wondering whether Latin America might not be uh, a bigger ally for your uh, argument and, and project. Uh, than, than he now was uh, summarized. And uh, I, so I would agree that Levinas uh, has not uh, registered the, the injunction and the poetry. That, that's something I would, would grant you immediately. And that has much to do with his you know, allegiance to uh, terminology, critique of naturalism, psychologism, sociologism, culturalism. And, have you. And, uh, but there are two moments that I thought uh, might make Levinas less of a, uh, you know, uh, defender of the abstract universal of uh, Greek Eurocentric philosophical logocentrism, as it were. And so, two things. So I, my sense is that for Levinas, quite the only. Anthropology figures only uh, negatively or largely in the sense that you know uh, anthropology describes and the rule explicitly describes the uh, the world uh, at which uh, the human self is uh, absorbed by an uh, amorphous, indistinct other. So that would be the the role of mythical participation. And now the greatness of Greek philosophy is to have broken apart those uh, mythical uh, diffused developments, these absorptions of the self by the other, by having posited the self as, uh, as an identity um, uh, that is separate. Mm. Uh, and that now, in its quest, starts to uh, absorb the other. Uh, to the point that we have, you know, a philosophy of identity, of totality, of the neuter, uh, ontology, you name it. Uh, everything that goes then into the head, the heading of the Western uh, essence. Now, what I guess seems to suggest is, is, is two things, it seems to me. That on the one hand, uh, it is the greatest, unsurpassable result of that Western Greek, European, thought that for all its uh, identification and totalization of everything other, uh, nonetheless was able to somehow auto-correct itself, uh, turn itself against itself. And uh, that's a major claim, that may be false, but it's not very different from what Nietzsche would have said. When, you know, it's the, it's the spirit of uh, lady kind of introspection of self-questioning of Christianity itself that you know allows us to diagnose the uh, the cataclysmic forms that nihilism will, will, will have taken. Or it's not so different from what the dialectical thinkers we have, you know, the one who talked by Peter Gordon on Adorno and, and the Habermasians and, and what have you, that somehow dialectical uh, negativity ultimately can turn itself against dialectical totalities of, of, of sorts that have turned everything into uh, the role of, of, of the self-same. 
So that may be still a form of um, you know, philosophical imperialism in the sense of uh, inscribing the philosophical idea of universality in a particular nationality, as Pradhan might have said, that goes indeed from you know, Greece to Gertrude. Uh, but um, it is, in a sense, also a self critical thought. So that, like, now at a certain moment in an interview, I forget exactly where, uh, that the critique of the anthropological critique of colonialism, uh, and he, he mentioned explicitly uh, Claude Davis Cope's, uh, could only have succeeded um, by standing on the shoulder of you know, the Eurocentric thought that, 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 that it condemns. So that would be one element. And the second element would be that um, I don't take my task to defend in the footstep of Rousseau um, an ethical, you know, universal or uh, an ethical uh, metaphysics that now substitutes for the uh, the reign of the theoretical logos that that Rousseau may have been after at least uh, in the early uh, part of it, but. I think there are two elements that may have a place in your, in your whole project. One would be that for Levinas, um, the ethical universal or the ethical absolute is not uh, intuitively given as a clear and distinct idea, but actually the result of uh, a process, not of translation so much, but of, of exegesis. The beautiful essay, the Lethique and Exegesis. And for Levinas will say, you know, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, you know, one would have to grant Spinoza that this is composed, constructed, fabricated out of many, many layers. And that does not make the miracle of the Bible uh, less, it makes it actually greater. And then there's not just the Hebrew Bible, not to speak of, uh, not to mention all the rabbinical commentaries that for Levinas, you know, belong to his exegesis and to his very meaning. But there's also the world literature. And I mean, even, I think, in that same context where he mentioned David Strauss as well, you know, it may very, very well be the case that Buddhism has, you know, sensed this uh, being of, of, of ethical others, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know Buddhism, so, you know, that would be for others to, 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 to add. And uh, in addition to these, you know, um, multiple worlds of, um, Diversifying, translating, or uh, exegizing uh, uh, the biblical language, the work of, of, of Jerusalem. There are the world literatures, right? What you, what you get out of the Bible, out of the, of the, the rabbis, and, and, and what have you, you might just as well, and actually, let me not go there before, get out of Shakespeare, out of Dostoevsky, out of Paul's story, uh, and, 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 and what have you. But the, but the bottom line, I think that this may be where the difference would be between you and um, uh, Levinas, definitely between Levinas and, and Bello Fouti, is that uh, something in that particular essay that you referred to in uh, Liste de l'Autron insists on something which he calls, I think, if I remember correctly, a signification without the context. And it seems to me that that, uh, you know, can easily take the place of uh, a very fundamental uh, imperial uh, logocentric thought, even in an ethical guise, but it may also allow for some critical uh, potential. And I always feel that, you know, if Levinas, for all this, uh, being steeply, deeply steeped in certain traditions and not others, and, you know, for all the fact that there are uh, uh, insensitivities in, in many of the statements that he has made. Uh, that you know, one would perhaps want to rethink or avoid. Nonetheless, that whole, that whole idea of an, uh, signification without a context is, is, is kind of crucial. And uh, I think it takes a very simple form that, you know, for me alone there would be no language. But for me and, and, and my peer or, or kin or the one other that I love or, you know, with whom I have a partnership, uh, that would not create a genuine la language of an ethical impetus either. So there has to be one other. But in that one other, who would be, you know, the signification, but not from within our or my context. Um, in that one other, there is uh, invested all the other others. Mm -hmm. And, well, 
what I find difficult is to squeeze that into a notion of lateral or more comprehensive or, or, or um, universal. I, I think it, it's an uh, unapologetic thought of the absolute. Not as, you know, the big other, as it were, but that which absolves itself from my present context or the present context of, the, of the, myself and the one other uh, to my uncomfortable. It's the one uncomfortable other. And that, I think, is hard to think without invoking virtual uh, universality. Is, is this true that he, he explicitly says that we need some kind of return to Platonism, to a form of Platonism, which is uh, the only way for him to speak about cultures? I do think that the, 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 blind, the blind spot in Levinas' philosophy is how you talk about the others in the plural, how you talk about the other in the singular, that is beautifully done in the ethics and the uh, I is thou, a dyadic relation. The other is the one who caves naked. And the, the naked face, the equivalent of the naked face is, and you are absolutely right, this idea of signification also without context. So his is not a classical Eurocentrism where you would be talking about the exceptionalism of European values. If there is something exceptional, it would not be the European values. It would be, on the contrary, the capacity of Europe to interrogate and question values, the, the valuation itself. So when he says that Europe has this anthropological vocation to understand the others better than they have understood themselves, it is true that this is not just a given. It is because for him, Europe has done that self-critical uh, turn upon its own self and reached some kind of transparency to, uh, to, to itself, which would justify it. So you are absolutely right. This, uh, he just thinks that the, the, the location where this signification without context is possible. And therefore, this self-critical discourse about oneself is possible, is Europe. And because of philosophy. And in that sense, he's a continuator of, of Husserl. So, uh, uh <coughs> and to, to which uh, I would adopt the response given by by Amartya Sen, who said that if we now change the significance of Eurocentrism, and we are not saying anymore that there is an excellence of European values, but Europe is the location of uh, the spirit uh, uh, criticizing itself, uh, of, of self-criticism, he says we are not better off we have to consider that this self-critical capacity is inscribed, in fact, in all human cultures. There is not such a thing as a division between a location where one can be self-critical of oneself and other locations where people just adhere to their own traditions, uh, values, and so on, without being able to uh, uh, create the critical distance from which they would be seeing it. Uh, and that is one, one aspect. But uh, when I say that the blind spot is uh, the discourse about the others, uh, I don't think that um, he is truly equipped in his, uh, in his uh, uh, thinking about autre manquette, otherwise than being, or this ethical relation, to just look at uh, uh, the spectacle of a world where you would have equivalent culture and languages being given out there. And uh, yes, you, 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 uh, you have these, these passages when he elaborates more about uh, this idea of, of, of transparency, but you have also other passages where he just says things that are not uh, 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 worthy of, of, of him. Uh, for example, he has this quote about, look at uh, people in South Africa dancing at funerals uh, as a very dismissive, disdainful uh, quote about people in South Africa. It is true that in the culture of Mandela, when someone dies, Mandela did have that 
move that he had, but at the same time, uh, the face given by Mandela's culture to the adventure of the human being in general is not something that should be uh, 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 talked about so lightly as uh, to, uh, to the point when he coined the expression of uh, dancer cultures in opposition to a culture in which you do not dance at, at funerals. So this kind of insensitivity, to, to, to take your word, does show that this is, I think, the discourse on cultures uh, and translation. And when I, when I consider translation, this is another point that I would have added to my first uh, 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 comment, uh, with, uh, to Maya's comment, is that uh, I am uh, very much uh, uh, insistent on the uh, Bermanian notion that translation is a putting in touch of languages and a form of creation of reciprocity. The notion of reciprocity which is involved in language is something very important and this is why the lateral universality for me can only be a universality if it is something in which reciprocity and equivalence are, are engaged. But uh, um, I, I, I don't think, I, it doesn't take out anything about uh, um, about uh, uh, Levinas philosophy, and uh, I, I, this is a philosophy that I admire very much. Not only, not just the, the, the ethical, uh, the ethics, but also as you mentioned the exegesis, uh, I, I like his Talmudic readings, uh, for example, they are uh, uh, admirable, I, I, I think as well. <laughs>